Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first webinar of 2023 from the Institute of Export and International Trade, looking at how to manage the costs of international trade this year. And we hope you agree that this is a really important topic, given the amount of news stories about the ongoing cost of living crisis and the impact of inflation on doing business. Just this morning, a report was published by insolvency firm Begbie's trainer, saying that a wave of businesses could enter bankruptcy this year, with a number of businesses suffering from financial distress rising by around 36% towards the end of last year. The report claims that this is not just due to the cost of living crisis and Brexit, but also because various support schemes from during the pandemic are coming to a close at around the same time soon as well. So we really do hope you find this webinar useful, at least from an international trade perspective. My name is William Barnes Graham, the Executive Editor of the Institute, and I will be your host for this morning's webinar. But on the next slide, we'll start to introduce today's speakers. So there we go. And it's my delight to welcome two debutants uh, to this particular programme anyway. So let's begin with the Institute's Public Affairs Advisor, Grace Thompson. Hi there, Grace. How are you today? Hi, Will. Good, thanks. How are you? I'm good. I'm good, thank you. It's always nice when the hosts get asked, asked that question back, actually. So yeah, very good, thank you. Um, great to have you on board. Grace has wide experience in public affairs, both as an advisor to MPs and working at Edelman Global Advisory before joining the Institute. Grace will be today talking about the political backdrop behind the trading environment many of you find yourselves in today. We'll also be hearing from one of the Institute's customs and trade specialists in Samantha Hodgkins. Hi Sam, welcome aboard. How are you today? Hi Will, I'm very well, thank you. Uh, really looking forward to this webinar. As, as am I and I hope your audience too. Uh, Samantha or Sam will be drawing on her vast experience working in international trade to talk about some of the practical solutions that are available to traders to help you manage any new and additional costs which have occurred over the last couple of years. Before handing over to Sam and Grace Ray, you'll see on the next slide that we're going to begin today's webinar with a quick poll to find out a little bit more about you, our audience. So we are asking here, which of the following is your biggest barrier to trade in 2023? Options there include administrative barriers, tariffs, complexity of rules, market access, and there's an other option as well. If you do say other, please feel free to type in uh, what that other is in the chat. While you are answering that poll, some housekeeping notes from me. Firstly, you can contact me with any comments or questions using the question panel on the control window, usually to the right-hand side of your screen. We hope to get to a number of your questions today, though please note that we cannot guarantee we'll get to every question in the allocated time, which is around 45 minutes. As such, I'll be prioritising questions that have relevance to the wider audience, so I won't be going into company or sector-specific queries as such. If you do have specific questions, uh, do avail yourself of the International uh, Technical Helpline, which the Institute offers. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. And please note that if your questions are short and clear, I am more likely to be able to read them. Finally, you will receive access to today's slide pack, as well as a recording of the webinar in a follow-up email we will be sending over the next day or so. Now, thank you everyone for voting. I'm going to share the results of that poll. So 51% uh, of you have said complexity of rules, 26% of you administrative barriers, 11% tariffs. Now, when we, we actually asked this question in another webinar at the end of 2022, and it was actually really similar. So at, at that time, the majority of you said complexity of rules, and just under a third of you again said administrative burden. So Sam, it, not much change in the response since the end of last year, but any surprises in how people have responded to that poll? Uh, you're right, no, not much change. And that, that's exactly what I would have expected to see. Um, a lot of new 
exporters are finding it really difficult to navigate their way post Brexit uh, with the border operating model and the changes that are planned or that have already come into effect, it can be quite difficult, especially if you're not used to the world of exporting. Thanks, Sam. And obviously, we'll be going into a bit more detail about that as the webinar goes on. But thank you, everyone, for responding to that poll, revealing as ever. It's now my pleasure, though, on the next slide to hand over to Grace, who will be briefly recapping why we're in the situation we're in at the start of 2023, particularly some of the political factors behind what many people have described as a challenging time to be doing business. Over to you, Grace. Well, um, well, hello everyone. Um, it's great to be speaking to you today, and I'm going to briefly give a bit of the political backdrop to the current economic challenges we're facing in the UK. Um, so, as published uh, in the Guardian yesterday, and, and some of you may have seen this, um, the Office for Budget Responsibility has recently forecast that one trillion uh, pounds of exports could be achieved by around 2035 without additional intervention. Now, if this is achieved, in 2035, um, and it's not definite, uh, it will be about 15 years behind the original target. And the Minister for Exports, Andrew Bowie, spoke about the external factors affecting the UK's performance. Uh, he said um, that we recognise the speed by which the UK reaches this milestone will be impacted by macroeconomic factors such as global demand and exchange rates. And um, he added that shocks and a spike in inflation have, have caused difficulties. Um, and uh, that's kind of what we're going to talk about now, really, some of these uh, wider factors um, that have affected international trade um, and our domestic economy uh, in a bit more detail. So uh, let's start with, with Brexit. Um, it's so important to say at the outset that it's, it's really difficult to fully measure the impact of Brexit on the UK economy at this point. Um, Brexit is, is still an ongoing process. Um, you may know that um, Parliament is actually working currently on um, ascertaining which EU legislation um, needs to be retained or scrapped, for example, um, and, and there are still um, negotiating details uh, being worked out. Um, what we do know uh, economically about the impact of, of Brexit even is, is mixed. Um, for example, a joint research project by the Resolution Foundation and LSE University just last year showed that Whilst a depreciation-driven inflation spike increased the cost of living for households and caused business investment to fall, the UK hadn't seen a large relative decline in its exports to the EU, um, at least in comparison to, to what they expected it to be. Um, instead, UK imports from the EU fell more swiftly than those from the rest of the world. Um, so you can see there, again, sort of a, a mixed picture. Um, but the ability to, to construct tailored trade deals um, has certainly been quite a key follow-on outcome of, of Brexit, and there are um, undoubtedly some some benefits to this. Um, I think it's important to say that even you know that you'll you'll see there's been a myriad of, of commentators um, opining on Brexit's effects two years on, but what really matters and, and what we're here to talk about today is how businesses take advantage of of the situation we find ourselves in now. Um, there's a huge opportunity for trade level recovery um, and we just have to be equipped uh, to do this um, and businesses have to be equipped uh, up and down the UK for these changes um, and, and this is what is at the heart of what we do here at the IOE. Um, but let's move on to, to the COVID pandemic because part of the, uh, the, the difficulty in ascertaining cause and effect uh, of, of where we are in the economy at the moment is that we've had so many different things happening in the past few years, not just Brexit, but the pandemic and, and the invasion of Ukraine. Um, so let's talk about the pandemic for a bit. Um, the UK's economy suffered its worst recession in 100 years during the pandemic with economic activity halting across the country. That will be very vivid in our memories. Um, UK GDP plunged by almost 20% in the second quarter of 2020 and by 9.4% uh, for the year as a whole. Um, and in the first lockdown of March 2020, 24% of firms reported that they had paused training, trading. So you can only uh, imagine that the knock-on effects. Um, it wasn't until December 2021 that the UK economy returned to pre-COVID levels. Um, 
But that wasn't the end of the story, as we all know. And there are long term economic impacts of COVID which remain with us. And we see the fallout of that every day on the news. Um, but the uh, chief economic advisor to the Treasury, uh, Clem Claire Lombardelli, uh, recently estimated that the biggest long term economic impact of COVID is the human impact, um, particularly the departures from the labour market, um, the lost education and the damage to mental health. And all of this has an impact not only on the economy of the UK as a whole, but on you know, your businesses and, and workforces up and down the country. And as if all of that wasn't enough, um, the tragic uh, invasion of Ukraine by Russia in February last year has caused economic shocks that have just reverberated around the world. Um, so as the UK does not have strong direct trade links with either Russia or Ukraine, uh, the effects of Russia's Ukraine uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has been less impactful on the UK than it has been on many other European countries. But however, the global inflationary pressure has still caused issues, both in terms of the global price of energy and domestic price increases. So higher fuel and energy prices have caused the costs of producing goods and services to rise in proportion to the energy intensity of production. And this has uh, clearly hit many businesses hard and particularly um, energy intensive businesses and, and, and manufacturers. Um, now, at this point, I, I'd just like to briefly flag that the Parliamentary International Trade Committee launched an inquiry just last week into the effects that the invasion of Ukraine has had on the UK economy and businesses across the UK. Um, if you'd like to submit written evidence to that inquiry, definitely encourage you to do so, so that you can um, explain how your business has been affected. Um, and the deadline for that submission is Friday the 17th of March, so you've got a bit of time to collate some data to, and to write that submission. Um, now, I know a lot of what I've laid out here sounds quite gloomy and apologies for that. It's been obviously a very difficult few years for, for businesses and, and individuals alike. But I'd like to give a few words of encouragement before my colleague um, Samantha speaks about what businesses can do to navigate these challenges. Although 2023 is undoubtedly going to be a tough year, the UK economy is due to grow by 1.6% in 2024. And the UK government has options at their disposal to improve um, the economic situation, such as considering regulatory changes, improving mobility to help trade and services, and a topic that seems to come up at every political conference I go to, um, providing a comprehensive plan to combat the skills gap. More widely, the International Monetary Fund is even considering upgrading their economic forecasts because the economic uh, outlook is less bad than they feared and inflation is starting to slowly head down. Last week at the World Economic Forum in Davos, uh, Christine Lagarde, president of the European Central Bank, observed that businesses are moving from defence mode to competition mode. Um, and that is what the Institute is also trying to support businesses to do. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Grace. I think there's, there's some really important context there, um, but also really important to end on that kind of positive note that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. So, so thank you for sharing that uh, political backdrop there. Uh, just for a couple of people who asked, uh, Grace wasn't presenting slides, they're very much opening remarks, but Sam will be presenting slides on the practical solutions to some of the issues alluded to uh, shortly. We're going to answer, I do, I just want to pick up on a few questions uh, which I have and then a few user questions as well. And Sam, if I can start with you, Grace mentioned Brexit as something that has impacted the cost of doing business. What costs has it added to businesses and are there, are there any examples of costs that actually Brexit may have even reduced? Uh, the first shock from Brexit was the all shipments from the EU now require uh, clearance instructions and when you now export to the EU the same applies. There's a cost if you don't do your own clearance there is a cost associated with that um, that is on average about £25 from your clearing agent. Um, imports may have duty on them so that's something that didn't apply uh, pre-Brexit and we'll go on to special procedures and duty deferment later on but that that's the big hitter I think. Thanks Sam and by clearance that's that's the requirement to, to 
do declarations for the goods which are moving and yes. will that declaration then be cleared? Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, I mean, Grace, there's a poll at the end of last year on one of these webinars where 54% of respondents said the trade hadn't been affected by Brexit, but there was just under a quarter who said they're trading, they were trading less. You've noticed that the government has options at its disposal to create a better environment for businesses. Have you seen or heard anything from government to suggest that the terms of Brexit that were negotiated and are still being negotiated could be looked at again to, to create a more positive business, business, uh, business mm -hmm. environment? Yeah, thanks, Will. It's it's quite an interesting one uh, because I think what we've seen is a slight difference in approach between um, the Rishi Sunak administration and the, and the Liz Truss administration and the Boris Johnson administration. So we're in sort of a, another new era uh, in a very short period of time. And we've seen that um, there's been a sort of a more collaborative approach between uh, Rishi and, and uh, his European counterparts and, and you know, there's real progress at the moment, uh, apparently in, in talks on the Northern Ireland Protocol and hopes for, you know, um, some resolution by the end of February. But I think it, when, you know, when I was speaking about government options, I mean, a, a clear one here uh, is, is, is single trade window to support um, the, the, the free and efficient flow of, of trade. Um, the, you know, the cost of trade will be greatly reduced by a single trade window, um, streamlining trade interactions with border agencies reduces the admin burden um, and it also you know by putting the onus on government to facilitate the, the data sharing between border authorities and, and agencies it takes some of the, the pressure off business so I think we've got sort of I suppose it's a double-pronged uh, answer to your question you know hopefully we're seeing uh, relations with the EU improve under 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 Rishi a bit more of a collaborative approach but also there are various you know uh, options for government um, to you know, improve uh, the facilitation of, of efficient trade more broadly, and, and that includes the uh, single trade window as well. So there's the regulatory aspects, which obviously comes from the, the UK EU relations and the negotiations which are ongoing, but there's also a technological uh, process as well. And obviously, we've seen a few changes in the last year with CDS as well. So uh, these things are all being brought in to hopefully make trade easier. Hundred percent. <laughs> I mean, obviously, that's a Conservative government. Uh, my understanding is that a general election is unlikely in 2023. But if one were to happen, what, what impact could that have on Brexit and the UK's future relationship with the, with the EU? Yeah, that's a, a really good question. And, and um, I'm not going to uh, get too much into predicting who might win the next election. But um, uh, if, if we remain with the current administration, we, we might see more of the same. If uh, if Labour were to win, it would be interesting to see uh, what their um, approach is to uh, you know EU trading. Um, actually, uh, there, there's due to be a, a speech from Labour today from, from David Lammy, uh, the Shadow Foreign Secretary, um, to talk about um, the EU UK relationship, and and that's meant to be a kind of an olive olive branch, you know, a bit of talk about a, a new EU UK security pact. But they have been very clear so far. In saying that, um, you know, that we wouldn't be rejoining the EU uh, single market, um, and it was interesting to see Sakia Starmer, leader of the opposition, um, using his New Year's message to announce that he would bring forward a take back control bill if he wins the next election. Um, so that kind of rides on, on the back of, um, you know, previous administration, Conservative administrations, uh, you know, views on on Brexit, and he's going to use that bill very much to put, you know, devolution. Uh, yeah, our back into the local, local communities. So I think essentially we won't see it, you know, I wouldn't say that we'd see a reversal of Brexit under Labour. I think closer ties with Europe would definitely be on their agenda, but um, I wouldn't say that we should um, be looking for any big changes to the TCA, for example, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. I think it will, there will be a certain amount of, of continuity despite the, uh, a different party being in charge. And you've mentioned how the impact of Brexit and COVID have been difficult to uh, untangle and be in, in general there's a significant hit to the labour market which has followed from the pandemic and presumably as well from the loss of freedom of movement within the EU. How can the government begin to address some of those labour shortages in the market? I think this is a really challenging question and I think it's one that a lot of people are asking themselves 
Um, I know that um, uh, I, I went to the uh, Conservative uh, Party conference on behalf of the IOE uh, last year, and I know it's a question that, that the Prime Minister was asked and sort of dodged. Um, that I, you know, the, the, the current government isn't keen on, on relaxing the immigration uh, labour laws um, too far. Um, however, you know, that, that could well change under Labour. Um, I think there are options um, in terms of filling labour shortages anyway. I mean, I mentioned earlier about this comprehensive uh, skills plan that uh, a lot of people are calling for. And we, there is a, you know, a significant skills gap in the UK, but not just in the UK, across Europe. Um, the EU, I think, are actually having uh, a year of skills uh, either this year or, or next year because they're realising it's a problem as well. Um, and you know, we survey you know, quite a lot of our members to do with skills too. Um, I think, essentially, um, we need to look at where the skills gaps are in different sectors work out you know does it go back to education even do we need to have um more uh, education in high schools about different careers options I, I don't think there's many sort of uh international trade or manufacturing uh, apprenticeships that are advertised in schools and some of these kind of basic uh you know initiatives could help actually to to bring the workforce to a better place and my final thing is you know at a recent conference i was at they were talking about the importance of bringing over 50s back into the workforce who, who could return to the workforce and how to make things easier for them, whether it's in terms of ill health, uh, flexibility or, um, you know, caring responsibility, flexibility, whatever it might be. So there are a range of options available to, to strengthen the labour workforce from within the UK um, and further beyond as well. Thanks, Grace. Uh, really, really interesting stuff. Um, thank you, everyone, for the questions and comments which are coming through. Uh, comment from Sue, actually, in reference to the the average price of a declaration, if not using a, a an intermediary. Uh, Sue says, but actually, for them, it's, it's sixty pound average cost. Obviously, there'll be variation, I'm sure, in different yeah. points of the market, but uh, it's that's a considerable cost if you're trading, say, hundreds or, or maybe even thousands of commodities each go. So. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks Lou, for for writing that in. I mean, Sam, from your perspective, as someone who's on on the ground, kind of working with businesses on their post Brexit trade and customs processes, what are you seeing in the market? How are businesses dealing with these new rules? So I find that businesses who are used to importing and exporting are taking the Brexit changes in the stride, really, because they have the processes and procedures in place. So the importing and exporting is, is the same, really. It's for new businesses or businesses who are new to importing and exporting or who rarely import or export that are struggling the most. Um, so it's those that really need the support to navigate through the seemingly ever-changing roadmap. Uh, but that's where we at the IOE really come into our own. We've got the lunchtime learnings that will do the border operating model changes. Um, we've got the daily update emails to help keep traders informed and goods moving. You know, we will bring members the latest information and we offer training as well, which can help, you know, or consultation so that we can go uh, to a trader and tell them exactly what they need to do to be able to import or export compliantly. So we do offer that support to our traders. That's really important to, to know that there is support out there and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the Institute support later on again. So thank you for, for making that comment. Uh, we're getting a few comments in about what everyone's getting charged for their customs clearance and uh, actually people making the point that it's on both sides it's the export side and the import side so yeah. that's that's an interesting uh, point as well um but moving on from brexit we've got a few questions on some of the other things which have been touched on and some other bits as well um actually just before i go into the first one because it's about the impact of russia sanctions and i should say i posted the link to the uh the committee uh investigation which um grace alluded to earlier that's in the chat so uh do look at that if, if that's of interest but a question sam um i guess I'll, I'll come to you in this one is from derek 
what impact have, have the Western sanctions on Russia had on trade? So before the war, Russia's economy was the 11th largest in 2021, and it was Russia was integrated into the global economy. In addition to its oil and natural gas exports, Russia has been a key global supplier of several uh, metals, titanium, aluminium and nickel, and chemical gases used in semiconductor production, amongst their other commodities leaving shortages and a knock-on effect of higher prices. You only have to look at energy prices currently and delays within the supply chain. Uh, Russia has increased trade to non-sanctioning countries like China, but obviously those non-sanctioning, those countries that aren't currently sanctioning Russia have other considerations um, in regards to trade with the US, for example. So the sanctions on Russia have had a knock-on effect um, with trade, with the supply chain, and it has increased uh, costs for our traders on the whole. I should have lead actually, we did a webinar last year, basically a week within the invasion about the impact of the sanctions uh, on trade and how businesses can ensure compliance with those sanctions. So. Um, I can post a link in a moment uh, to that webinar, but it's definitely worth a rewatch, and we'll be covering it hopefully again next month. It's, it's obviously coming up to a year since the, the the invasion began, and while primarily it is a you know it's a tragedy and uh, the amount of human loss and devastation which is caused is uh, really abhorrent. Um, obviously, it has had these knock-on effects on supply chains and trade, so we'll we'll look at that again uh, next month. Um, on a slightly different topic, just back to the pandemic, Hattie uh, says, during the pandemic, freight rates climbed substantially. Is it true that they are now normalising? Uh, Sam, do you want to take that one? Yeah, Hattie, you're correct. Freight costs hugely increased during the pandemic as demand was at a premium. A 40-foot container shipping from China to the US was over $20,000 in September 2021. But now I'm happy to report that it's $1,400, which is now heading towards pre-pandemic prices. That price decrease is being mirrored here in the UK and beyond. So prices are coming down. Um, the container shortage has relaxed. Uh, so yes, prices are starting to look like pre-pandemic prices. So that's good news all round. That is good news, and um, that was a real problem during the pandemic, wasn't it? So that's uh, really a bad, 20K that's a cost saving. For a, 20k for a container from China to the US is is ridiculous. It's a ridiculous price when now it's 1400. You know, ridiculous. Poor traders. <laughs> it really has been a tough little period for traders, but as you say, there's there's a glimmer of hope on that side of things there. Uh, we'll do a couple more questions at this point um, before we go into some practical solutions with Sam uh, around kind of the, the duties and the declaration uh, requirements. But it's an interesting one from Gary Grace, who asks, what impact, if any, is climate change starting to have on the cost of doing trade? That is a very interesting question. And uh, yeah, thanks for that one, Gary. Um, Yes, well, climate, you know, climate change is un undoubtedly going to impact across all of our lives. And it's very important for, for businesses and traders to be ahead of the curve on this. Um, and, uh, you know, it's important to acknowledge at first there may be some, you know, costs of, of changing systems and implementing new policies. But long term, uh, obviously, it's a very Im important thing to do and will actually hopefully speed up um, the uh, uh, the processes of trade um, by digitalizing um, it becomes more climate change friendly but also more um, more more business friendly I would say in terms of uh, you know speed of, of processes and, and, and cutting admin costs um, I think there's been a shift change in thought particularly in recent years um, and, and this has been as we've seen that um, climate change is, is having an increasing impact I think last year was the UK's hottest year um on record um so we're seeing uh across the business community there's great 
realization that that more has to be done to uh, make international trade uh, more sustainable. Um, and I, I know that we're thinking about that a lot at the institute and um, setting up a, you know so, some functions to help businesses get advice on how they can um, improve their ESG uh, ratings and, and and that sort of thing. So yeah, well, this is a, a crucial one going forward. And I think with the passage of you know, bills such as the Electronic Trade Documents Bill through Parliament, we're seeing that there's a seriousness about making trade more sustainable and efficient hand in hand. Good stuff. Uh, conscious of time, so I'll do one more question at this stage. It's a really good one from Sally, who's talk talks about the, um, the currency impact of the, what was obviously quite short-lived trust administration at the end of last year when the pound weakened significantly for, for a period. Um, Sally asks, how likely is this sort of thing to happen again? And what can we do to mitigate against it happening in the future? I mean, that's two parter. So great. So I don't know if you want to take the first part and then Sam to, to look at the, the mitigation aspect, but, but, but Grace, how likely is something like that, which was really quite dramatic? How likely is that to happen again? Um, oh, wow. It's, it's, it's an interesting one. I mean, I don't think anyone could have predicted that um you know we would be in a situation where such a shock would would happen um so in some ways it would be very easy for me to say oh that was a, a big blip and it will never happen again um politics is unpredictable and you know depending on who's in power and what their agendas are you know ver very much uh, you're you're laid open to uh, uh the direction of their policy making however um, I think it was a fairly rare occurrence. Um, I don't see any politicians on the horizon in the next, you know, five to ten years who are going to have a similar sort of uh, philosophical agenda as trusted at that point in time. Um, and I know that that Sam will will say about more about the mitigation, but the one key way in my mind that you you can you sort of uh, protect yourself as a business against some of the shock impacts of these uh, policies is, is, you know, obviously good, you know, business and contingency planning. But to some extent, uh, you know, in a, an uncontrollable situation like that, it was it was rare, and there was not much any of us could, could do about it. I hope that's fair. Uh, yeah. I was going to say, I have to say, a tough political climate can be hard to plan for. Absolutely, and many factors affect exchange rates. It may be that we need to go back to basics and changing the contracts um, that we have with our suppliers or with our buyers, for example. You know, having a fixed exchange rate in the contract or changing how you get paid so you get payment in advance so you know how much you're going to be paid for something. Um, that's so looking at those contractual terms may be the way that that you can ensure you know how much you're going to get for your goods or how much something is going to cost you. Thanks, Sam. Um, I'm conscious we're, we're probably going to we could, could, we could probably stretch this one to an hour. I think this webinar because I think the next section is going to be really important. Uh, just a quick couple of comments. By the way, Elka says uh, they completely agree with Grace. Uh, we should start promoting export international business themes at comprehensive schools. And Martin says, uh, points out that Brexit has also increased the cost of exporting where vet certificates uh, are now yeah. all of a sudden required for, for uh, animal origin uh, goods. So uh, really good points there, Elka. And Martin, on the next slide, uh, just before we, we get into customs authorizations, we're going to ask a poll just to gauge whether you, the audience, already use customs authorizations. And Sam, at this point, obviously you, you're about to talk about this in more detail, but just so people can answer the question of anything, what are customs authorizations? Customs authorizations are special procedures that allow you to defer duty payments. Um, you have to meet certain criteria, which we'll go into shortly. But yeah, if you if you are able to meet the criteria of the special procedure that you're applying for, you can um, defer or reduce duty payments. 
sounds quite useful. So I'll give you just a couple more seconds to answer the poll, and this will be helpful for Sam actually just to, to uh, gauge kind of who, you, what, you, what your level of understanding is potentially. So thank you everyone for responding. Uh, so 48% of you do use customs authorizations, 38% of you don't, 15% not sure. So a bit of a mix. Again, we don't know exactly um, uh, who kind of who you are, who's attended today. So there could be various reasons for you to be using or not using authorizations. But uh, thank you for responding. And I hope that helps Sam as I now hand over to you for, for your parts of the presentation. So over to you, Sam. Thank you, Will. Next slide, please. So we're going, I'm going to start this presentation talking about compliance. A compliance program should be effective, appropriate and proportionate. You need policies and procedures that are adopted by exporters to facilitate compliance um, with UK customs regulations. Now you may think, what does it have to do with me? I'm only shipping something out, out of the door. Well, compliance costs, or rather non-compliance costs. So uh, in regards to compliance, you need to be able to know your product in the first instance. And that means you need to know the commodity code. You need to have been able to assign that to your product so that you're, you'll be paying the correct duty rates. You also need, need to be able to know whether your product is military and therefore licensable or dual use and therefore licensable. Uh, Will, I believe you've got a link to the commodity code checker that you'll pop in the chat for me. It's important that staff training uh, is in place so that everybody who deals with an export knows what to do. Due diligence, do you know who your end user is, who your customer is, who are you shipping out to? You know, um, are they on the sanctions or embargoed list? If you do have licensable product, have you signed up to use those licenses? If it's an OGEL or have you applied for a seal, for example? Um, and can you meet the licensing requirements in regards to that product? And as I mentioned earlier, you need robust processes and procedures in place and you need good record keeping. So as I say, uh, you may think it doesn't bear any any relation to you, but as we'll see on the next slide, please, it compliance with UK and EU customs laws is not voluntary. Indeed, you need to comply with the export laws of whatever country you are operating in. HMRC can, at their discretion, impose civil monetary penalties in lieu of criminal prosecution for violations of the UK's export control laws. These powers to issue monetary penalties exist alongside prosecutorial enforcement options, which can result in the imposition of criminal fines or imprisonment. We'll cover, sp cover special procedures in a moment, but one of the possible outcomes of non-compliance is the amendment or removal of your authorization. Any missing duty or VAT becomes payable once discovered. And as you can see there, in a six month period to 19 exporters, over 700,000 pounds in fines was issued. And the fines were for the export of unlicensed dual use and military goods as related to the Export Control Order 2008. So hopefully you'll see that non-compliance will cost you more than being compliant. At the very least, it will cost you your business reputation. Next slide, please. Special procedures can help companies save duty costs on imported goods 
resulting in a positive impact on your bottom line. The savings present significant value to the companies that use special procedures. However, there is an administration and reporting cost as it can be quite a cumbersome task for businesses. Some special procedures require sophisticated administration that in many cases cannot be dealt with by a simple spreadsheet. However, it will mitigate fluctuations in tariff barriers to trade. So as you can see there, more than two and a half billion in customs duties paid each year in the UK. And for the EU, that's 14 billion. So as an importer, you pay that, whether you're large or small, you pay that price based on your commodity when importing. So that's where it's important to know your goods and get the correct commodity so you know the duty rate that's applicable. You don't get any of that revenue back unless you claim the right exemptions. And those exemptions are the special procedures that we'll be going through. Next slide, please. So cus uh, customer special procedures are there to promote economic activity. Many countries offer the possibility of suspending or drawing back customs duties by means of special procedures. Their cost savings on customs and excise authorizations are universal, but they can have different names in different countries. So the main universal customs special procedures are customs or bonded warehousing. And customs warehousing allows the owner to hold important non-UK goods in the UK and choose when to pay the duty or whether to re-export the goods. Inward processing, which a lot of you may be familiar with, means that non-UK goods are imported in order to be used in the customs territory of the UK in one or more processing operations. Outward processing is the opposite of inward processing. It allows UK goods to be processed abroad and when they come back into the UK to be put into free circulation, duty must be paid only on the value added abroad. There's temporary admission, which allows goods to be brought into a, a country temporarily, typically for less than 24 months, with total or partial relief from import duty. This special procedure is often used for events like trade shows, art exhibitions, or music festivals. Then we have end use, and that's where relief reduces or eliminates customs duty on certain imported goods, which meet defined criteria and are put to a specific use within a set period of time. This special procedure only applies to certain tariff codes, such as goods in the aerospace, shipbuilding and defence industries. And finally, we have temporary storage, and that allows companies to store goods at an authorised storage facility, where they can be controlled by customs for up to 90 days without having to pay tax or duty. And Will, I believe you have a link to pop in the chat for me at this point to the gov.uk website that shows all of the special procedures that you can apply for. Next slide, please. So, you may have heard under the border operating model about free ports. There are going to be eight free ports in the UK, East Midlands Airport, Felixstowe and Harwich, Humber, Liverpool, Plymouth and South Devon, Solent, Teesside and Thames. They're either planned or operable. So free ports is a designated area and it's classed as being outside of the UK for the purposes of VAT and duty. It allows for duty-free movement into the free port and the ability to transfer ownership in goods VAT-free whilst the goods remain in the location. The normal VAT and duty rules will apply once the goods leave the designated area. 
uh, the Freeport is uh, the Freeport area is uh, has a 45 kilometer radius and you may find that your business is already in a Freeport area. So it may be something that you you want to explore. Being a part of a free port allows for simplified customs declarations, uh, duty suspension, and goods can move between other UK free port sites within the UK under a declaration by conduct. conduct. So you can import raw materials to one free port, for example, and if your manufacturing facility is at a different free port, you can transfer the raw material to your manufacturing site and you don't pay any duty or VAT until you release those goods into free circulation in the UK or you re-export them. There's no time limit for storing or processing goods, unlike temporary storage, which is 90 days. Uh, you don't need a customs guarantee. And as an authorised business, you can utilise the benefits of a custom site operator. So each free port will have a custom site operator. Um, and you basically sign up to those. And goods may move between processing and storage under free ports. So I know that Liverpool is live. Um, and it's a great success at the moment. In regards to free ports, there are lots of support available. Um, as I say, the support packages, uh, you can have um, lots of different grants to help you set up within a free port. So again, that's something that we've done a webinar on. So you may want to go and search out that webinar link uh, to find out more information on free ports. Next slide, please. AEO operator status. So you may have heard of AEO. There's two types of AEO, um, AEO status. And it's an internationally recognized through a mutual recognition agreement or MRA quality mark that enables businesses who have AEO status to show other customs authorities that they meet the World Customs Organization's required standards. That allows the AEO business to benefit from fewer physical and documentary checks and from priority treatment if selected for inspection at the border. So if they had two shipments, one AEO and one not, they would check the non-AEO status goods. AEO status is a sign that your supply chain is secure. And as a business, you can apply for AEO status via the HMRC website. And we at the IOE will of course support your application if you wish. It also allows for simplified declarations on entry. Now, for micro, small and medium sized businesses, there is a trusted trader program, um, which is less technical but, and easier to get that status than AEO. AEO is, for, is aimed at, not for, but it's aimed at larger businesses, um, who have processes and procedures in place and who can meet the terms of the AEO application. Next slide, please. So other considerations to reduce your costs. Inco terms. Inco terms set out shipping um, costs and responsibilities and when ownership of goods transfers. As I've mentioned, it sets out the costs. So you need to make sure that the INCO terms that you currently use as a buyer or a seller work for you. Are you aware of what costs are incurred for which INCO terms? Um, again, it's something to, to consider. 
modes of transport, you know, how quickly do your goods need to get to destination? Can they go via road rather than air freight, for example? Can you reduce costs that way? UK trade agreements. So if you if your goods country of origin is under a UK trade agreement, you'll pay preferential duty rates. So it may be worth considering looking at where your suppliers are based and where your goods country of origin is. As with everything, a streamlining of processes uh, will save you time, which saves you money. So have a look at the processes and procedures that you have in place. Can you streamline them? Uh, my colleague has mentioned the electronic uh, documents uh, and processes and procedures that the government want to bring into place in the single trade window, all of that streamlining can save you money. There are hidden costs as well in payment terms. For example, uh, letters of credit, you know, there are charges applicable on a letter of credit. So you may want to look at your payment terms and, and look at things that aren't going to cost you quite as much money. Uh, as one of our members said, there are costs related to health certificates and um, other certificates, special packaging. Are you gonna, if there's special packaging required, are you gonna pass that on to the customer or are you expected to pay it? All of those hidden costs really need looking into so that your bottom line gets lower. Next slide, please. So at the IOE, we offer a range of consultancy services. Uh, we do business health checks, which will check as to whether you're compliant, duty mitigation, uh, trading with new markets, customs compliance and procedures, special regimes such as IP and OP, and AEO application support and other, other support that you may need as well. So we will help you um, in your application process and whatever co consultancy needs that you have. Will. Thank you, thank you, Sam. That's a nice note to finish on again. Um, we'll We've got a few minutes left for some, some final questions. Um, hopefully Grace is able to stay with us as well, um, as well as Sam. So we'll, we'll do a kind of three or four questions now. Um, while we're doing that, uh, the next slide, we'll, you'll see we're, we're just gonna do a couple of polls. We'll just have these going on in the background. So we won't talk too much about the polls, but um, first one's just asking if your company would benefit from the, some of the authorizations mentioned by Sam just now. On um, Sam, to begin with, on AEO and uh, the trusted trader thing you mentioned as well, John asks, how difficult is it to get a AEO status? And as, as you noted, it's more relevant for bigger companies. Can it be a worthwhile exercise for SMEs? Is there, are there alternatives for SMEs as well? Um, it can be complicated, but it certainly isn't insurmountable. As, as I mentioned, for MSME traders, there is the option of becoming a trusted trader, and it's a lighter program than AE, AEO, sorry, with the simplified qualification criteria. AEO is more relevant to larger organizations as it has a higher entry bar, including customs compliance, financial status, and security standards. Now, there's nothing stopping an MSME applying for AEO status as long as they can tick all of those boxes. Thanks, Sam. And a few people asking about the, to go into a bit more depth about the criteria that usually apply uh, for the various customs procedures uh, you mentioned. So we had Andrea ask what's the usual criteria, uh, Lewis asked something similar. And then it also had a question from Ewan asking about guarantees from a bank for in the processing. Is, is that a criteria as well, which applies to other procedures? Okay, in, uh, in regards to bank guarantees, it's I can't give you a yes, absolutely, you will need a bank guarantor. It depends 
on your application and HMRC will tell you at the time of application if you need one. Um, in regards to criteria, again, you need to be able to meet the criteria for the specific special procedure that you're applying for. So for example, in regards to outward processing, uh, you need details of how your records will be held, how the goods will be sent out, where the goods will be exported from, if you'll use simplified declarations, how long they'll be outside of the UK, details of the goods being processed, such as commodity codes, description and value, and the amount of goods you'll be exporting, etc. In general, you need to be compliant to be able to show good record keeping, be financially solvent, established in the UK with an EORI number, and then start your application. Thanks, Sam. That's a good little checklist there for uh, to, to get going with. But uh, as noted, there's the various support from the Institute as well uh, to help you uh, get these authorizations. The link, the link that you popped in the chat earlier with all the special procedures that will go through if if the members click on it. That will go through each special procedure and uh, describe exactly what you need to do to be able to meet the, that criteria. Good stuff, good, good stuff, good stuff. A, a really good point, actually. Uh, that, that link was in the chat earlier on. Uh, I won't dwell too much on the results of this poll, but again, thank you everyone for responding. Uh, two thirds of you say yes, 12%, no, uh, a quarter, not sure. And again, there's various reasons for um, various situations your business is going to be in. So uh, it's good to see that some of this, this support we mentioned earlier today is helpful to, to many of you. Just a quick uh, a note, uh, Paul, who's in the audience, made the point that um, there's eight English reports, but there's also two Scottish reports and a Welsh report, yeah. I think, um, being planned as well. So uh, it's a UK-wide uh, scheme and uh, more information will, will come out on those, I'm sure. Question uh, from Matt for Sam again. Because, uh, we mentioned CDS very briefly earlier. Uh, Matt asked, will there be any cost for us to start using uh, the new CDS platform? No, you'll need a government gateway account uh, because that's how you use CDS, but actually using CDS is free. However, if you do not use, do your own customs entries, whichever third party does them on your behalf will charge you for that service. Um, and going back to special procedures, there's no cost involved in applying for a special procedure um, other than the time it takes for you to apply. So really, you've got nothing to lose. If you think you can benefit from it, go for it. I like I like that. That's a, that's a nice, uh, 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 yeah, positive positive frame of mind here. Um, so a question from Sylvester. Uh, I'll start this with with Sam. We were told the UK's new free trade agreements would make it easier to trade with the rest of the world, but how do we actually benefit from these, Sam? Well, the UK has over 70 trade agreements in force currently. To benefit, you need to trade with one of the countries under an FTA with the UK. If we have an FTA with a country of origin of your goods, you'll benefit from preferential duty rates, for example, and that will show on the commodity code checker um, if you look it up using the online tariff tool, which was the first link of mine that you popped in the chat, that will show you, because you can search by country, um, what the duty applicable for your goods are. So that's that's the first way that we can benefit. Okay. Um, I mean, we're going to be doing more content on trade deals through the year. So keep your eyes uh, open for all of that. Um, I just want to uh, sort of start wrapping up shortly and I'm going to do just one last poll. Um, so I'm going to launch this now, which is what would you like most to see in 2023 in global trade? The options are uh, simply was of trade, reduce tariffs, digitalization, climate emphasis and supply chain issues to ease. And just while people are answering that poll, Grace, um, I, I guess a, a comment for yourself is um, we're just talking about trade deals just then with, with Sam. 
what is the current uh, view from government on on negotiating more trade deals? Because my understanding is we rolled over a load of agreements from the EU, but it's all about what getting the UK's own trade deals now. So what's the latest on, on that side of things? Thanks, Well, This is a really interesting area, actually, because um, the current Secretary of State for International Trade, uh, Kemi Badenoch, has taken a slightly different approach, and she um, is prioritising uh, depth over breadth in um, her uh, negotiation of free trade agreements around the world. And so this means that, you know, uh, trade deals are going to be signed slower. It's going to be a bit more, you know, detailed negotiation. Uh, she did a, a um, an interview over the weekend uh, with the Times, actually, uh, and she was saying that the India trade deal, which is currently being negotiated, might happen at some point this year. Now, uh, many people uh, on this webinar might remember that originally the, the deadline for that was um, Diwali last year, um, which I think is in, is in November. So um, obviously we're, we're seeing, you know, a bit more of an in-depth, let's really get these trade deals right approach. Um, and, you know, obviously we're seeing with trade deals now, you know, new chapters being added, you know, more of a focus on, on digital um, chapters. Um, and so, yeah, I think she's going to, her approach as Secretary of State is going to be a bit more um, detail focused. But also, I mean, I'd encourage as well, you know, as you see, um, the Department for International Trade putting out these calls for evidence on any free trade agreement that they're negotiating. It's good to be involved. It's good to submit evidence to DIT on that because um, the best way to help try and shape the outcome of these trade agreements, which are going to be tailored to each kind of country, um, is to be, you know, submitting evidence as businesses uh, to DIT. Thanks, Grace. That's, that's a really important point. And actually, if if you do follow the IRE's daily update, uh, keep an eye out for a couple of articles about the, the latest on trade deals and, and utilisation, uh, which are due in today's bulletin, actually, I believe. So uh, that'd be an interesting read, I'm sure. 47% uh, of you say simpler rules for trade. Again, that's not surprising given what's been mentioned earlier, but digitalization is up there on 20% as well. So yeah, thank you everyone for answering that poll, but I'm very conscious that we are now uh, running over. So I'd like to thank uh, Grace and Sam at this point for joining us today. A really interesting conversation, for sure, uh, despite the different uh, dif difficult economic climate, some reasons for for hope and optimism in there too. So thank you both again for, for a really interesting presentation and conversation. Before we go, I'd just like to highlight something on this slide. To help firms manage the additional costs of doing business and international trade in 2023, that have come about because of the after effects of the pandemic, new rules post Brexit and the impact of the war in Ukraine, the Institute of Exports and International Trade is doing a flash sale of its training courses. This means you can get a 25% discount on all of the courses if you use the code 25 off in numbers and capital letters when booking on a course before February 10th. This is a really great opportunity to get cheaper access to training in practical export and customs skills, including courses on trading with the EU, introductions to exporting and importing more generally, VAT, and so much more. So visit export.org.uk forward slash training for more information. We'll send you more information about this in the follow-up email, which you will get in the next day or so, including a link to the recording and slides from today's webinar, as well as, as, well as some of the useful links which have been mentioned. Please get in touch if for any reason this email doesn't come through to your main inbox. Before then, let us know what you thought of today's webinar and any suggestions for topics in future events by completing the short exit survey. But for now, thank you for joining us today and I hope you have a great rest of the day and week. Thanks everyone. Goodbye. Bye.